Welcome back to Book Club for Movies, everybody. It's May 17th. I'm Ryan Miller. And here's me, China. It's Matt Amber. <laughs> Mm-hmm. China plate. Yeah, mate. Yeah. I get it. You you <laughs> suddenly become very very cockney. I also do white gangster. I feel you like white I fe- cockney. <laughs> I feel like you you were you were closer in in terms of of awful cockney to Don Cheadle than <laughs> Terrence Stamp. But you know Is- what? <laughs> you know, a plus for attempt. That's right. Here at Book Club for Movies, where we talk about a movie that we've watched in the week past, we're going to talk about The Limey this week, wherein Steven Soderbergh originally workshopped his character for Don Cheadle in Ocean's Eleven. That's the only thing that could possibly make sense. <laughs> he totally he totally borrowed what he did here with that and, and put he, it in Don Cheadle's character. He's, he said, all right. I, I just realized I love Cockney slang. I'd never heard it before until until <laughs> Lem Hobbs wrote this. I got an idea. And thus creating my wife's just interminable disappointment with Don Cheadle because she thought he was British <laughs> for, gosh, until when did we see him? Maybe like the, the, uh, the genocide one. What's the genocide movie he was in? Hotel <laughs> Rwanda. Hotel Rwanda. That yeah. was real? <laughs> and she's like he's not british i'm like no he's he's african <laughs> in that movie he was you're right <laughs> i think he's from like like cincinnati or something <laughs> is it does he do a bad cockney in oceans 11 i always well, thought it was good it's I don't not have that a it's great ear for that. i mean it's not great it, it's i mean in comparison to terrence stamp it, you know it, uh, <laughs> I feel like Terrence Stamp does a very good one in this movie, The Limey. The Limey, The Limey, The Limey. <laughs> that was a good hit, and, and I, I, I had, I had, I had two competing thoughts, and they short circuited because I was going to say Don Cheadle was born in Kansas City, but then also you said you gave me that perfect in, and I was like, oh, do this part. <laughs> my head just shut down okay the Fishy. limey <laughs> yeah, exactly i'm glad that i'm glad that story is finally out there uh i should get that tattooed i should, I should get a fish tattooed check out the zero hit points from from two weeks ago right yeah Isn't if you want to hear out? me like it find out how dumb i was as a child hubris once again the fall of man, <laughs> the fall of Matt. All right, here we go. The Limey is going to roll in at an hour and 29 minutes, directed by Steven Soderbergh, written by Lem Hobbs, starring Terrence Stamp, Leslie Ann Warren, Luis Guzman, and the interminable, whatever word you said about your wife, Peter Fonda. The never ending Peter Fonda. That actually yeah. fits. Yeah, no, yeah. that's fine. Lem Hobbs, I, I, I just wanted to point this out screenwriter sir so uncredited writing on uh, on romancing the stone which Ooh. i love that movie i think it's great you also should. wrote the screenplay for one of my favorite sci-fi movies of the probably ever dark city oh really great full on full on screenplay for dark he, city huh he was a screenplay writer for dark city along with uh, proyas so fan freaking fantastic great, great movie, movie. Uh, all right, the limey. Here's here's our here's our breakdown, the rundown okay. of, of the limey. When his estranged daughter Jenny dies in a suspicious car accident, recently released prisoner Wilson travels from England to Los Angeles to find out the truth of who she was and what really happened. Do you get these from IMDb? No. <laughs> these are these are Amberg originals, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I try and, nice. I try and write them up as 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 dumb as possible it's good it's no they're good the oops i left the camera on part two okay, so okay i was gonna say you you want to start with that i know no interesting <laughs> I, I i don't know yeah. no no no. i okay so so if you go back uh two weeks ago we watched um another steven soderbergh film uh which which very much so runs into that whole turn the camera on what happens <laughs> logan lucky yeah. logan lucky and we talked a lot about Soderbergh, which actually, so I don't, I don't necessarily think that's where we start with this one. I feel like we've done so I, the Soderbergh due diligence here. But the Not one thing I want to, the one thing I want to bring up here, uh, in particular, is the editing in this movie. I think is really mm. fascinating and really, you, really well done. Now you're starting with a showstopper. 
I am. Oh, okay. Did, did, did you want to? Okay. We'll, we'll, no, no, we'll, no. We can start with that, but that's definitely that. In fact, that might be my favorite part of this movie. It is, it is, it is used really effectively. And this is one of those cases where, where I think Soderbergh was right on in let the camera go, but he was also good at having the editor finding the chunks that were, were perfect to fit the story. And in particular, something that comes up is, uh, a lot of the displaced dialogue and I love that in movies and it's not used a lot. And when it is, it's, it, it, it's, it's something that you can really screw up, but I think it's mostly used to good effect. And what I mean is it's that dialogue or sound or whatever that's playing over a sequence that is not related to the dialogue necessarily, but it becomes a punctuation for it. So, you know, it's, 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 um, he's he's doing something he's 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 getting ready and there's dialogue from a future conversation or past right. conversation that then kind of punctuates what he's going to finish out doing or saying or whatever and man i i they given editing credit in the credits i remember i saw it and i was like oh i have to remember that because the editing's freaking amazing and i did not remember that and it doesn't seem like imdb is making it easy enough to just tell you sarah flack editor. sarah flack that's the one does a fantastic job <laughs> and you're right the the way they use it kind of out of order like that but number one it's not a hard and fast rule like like th that's every single instance of it isn't what you just described you know right. there's some fluidity to it and but it is used in a way for the most part to like very quickly not not foreshadow but it, it, like they show you out of sequence and they do it with, with the video the audio something that's going to happen in the very near future so right. you see, you see a piece, and I'm gonna call them puzzle pieces because this, this is kind of what they turn into for me, anyways. Sure. They'll give you a puzzle piece, and then they'll show you where it goes, like within minutes, basically, is what it is. This becomes interesting for two different reasons. Number one, he uses it against you towards the middle of the film, mm -hmm. where they. So Terrence Stamp is looking for the guy that essentially is responsible for his daughter's death, who ends up being Peter Fonda, who ends up being like. I like Peter Fonda. I like his career. Like, easy writer. Like, sure. Yeah. 100%. But, man, is he a good Weasley guy? Like, oh. Like, he is terrific. He's freaking great. It's like, and, I feel like he's better than any of those other ones when he's so and, great. And, and here, here is, he, he's great because he is playing, he's playing that kind of Hollywood record producer garbage. -y, he's so good. Just oh, man. Like, he is the Weasley greasy. Complete weasel. Yeah, greasy. Absolutely. You just, you, you just know from, from just the way he kind of like his mannerisms that you just know the guy is like, like, he's not somebody that's that's worth your time like you, no. you just he's, or anything he's a complete waste of space right he totally is yeah and, and uh, basically take his character from ghost rider satan mm -hmm. and make him a little dirtier right and right and there here's this dude uh what's his name terry terry valentine terry valentine there you go anyway so so there's the point where he finally gets to him at a party and it's it's essentially the scene from Dumb and Dumber. This is why you come to this show, uh, where where uh, Lloyd shoots what's her name's uh, husband with a gun. And watch out, he's got a gun. Oh yeah, he he was just imagining it the whole time. So he he walks up to Peter Fonda and, and shoots him in a bunch of different ways. But that never actually happened. But you it, it, he's they're playing a trick on you because up until then and and after this the editing is used to show you what's going to happen in the near future just before that so they they give you these puzzle pieces and they mess with it and the second thing they do is they give you two or three recurring shots that they don't give you they don't show you where that puzzle piece goes within minutes right one of them is on a plane and i want to say the other one is uh kind of the hotel room although there might be something that tells you that took place at the beginning rather than the end i don't think so i'm I, not I, sure I, feel like, I think you're right as interested as i was putting these puzzle pieces together because i feel like it's a trick that that uh david lynch does a lot like i saw moholland drive but i was not as invested as putting those puzzle pieces together sure as i was with this movie and maybe that's because with david lynch i feel like you just never know like that, that if this is taking place in space somewhere you know, like or in an alternate reality. You're going like, to find out that they're all actually lice on a dog yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like here, that's never the issue. Like, you know, this is a story. This is, this is grounded for all the kind of weird editing tricks and, and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, but I, I loved, yeah, I love the editing, like the way they, they, 
messed with those and kind of gave you the puzzle pieces in a way. Maybe this is maybe this is Mulholland Drive for dummies. Like they, they give you the pieces, but they show you where they go within they should, a couple yeah, minutes. They, they, like you can figure it out. It's it's, it's the Duplo of puzzles. There you uh, go. Yeah. It is great. I, lo- I love the editing here and, and the editing works so well with the the soundtrack too. another thing that I think is I think a, another quality that Soderbergh always seems to have is is he, he knows how to pick. Music. Yeah, but different here than no, what it, we talked about before. Yeah. And I think I think it's I don't know if it's a screenplay, but I do. I loved what he I love the choices he made. You know, it, it, it yeah, felt no, like for it, sure. it fits, you know, like he, he understands how to make he understands how to make a low budget British crime flick that takes place in the Americas, <laughs> like and, yeah. and make the soundtrack in, in work the for Californias. Him. In the Californias, yeah. Like I've never seen a movie where I recognize so many of the spots in in the scenes. Right, yeah, because you know they had no 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 uh, no no permits to film. <laughs> they were just like, just go, just go, just go. It, it, it looks totally gorilla. I mean, it's almost hard to tell with with Soderbergh, but. Was that actually the case? No, like, I, I don't I, think I looked so. Looked up the stories. Okay, I don't think so. I if it was, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, for some of it, it like it, in fact, the first time we see Terry Valentine at his house, I'm like, oh, he lives at the Griffith Observatory, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, they <were laughs> which it, it ended up not being. But I was like, man, I wonder if they just like ran up and shot stuff and ran away. Sometimes. It, it's it's fun you know it, it's it's <laughs> it's it's a cool st- like the way it was filmed is fun it, it's no and the, it's the california-ness of it is is perfect like it's 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 a it's a character unto itself and it's fun yeah. because like it, it does bring there's this this great kind of <laughs> you have this this incredible historic british actor and you've got this incredible historic american actor terrence stamp peter fonda being filmed true. by 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 Steven Soderbergh in like the the like the 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 in the way that that they probably at least Fonda began you know like like Fonda has seen the Hollywood industry grow and and to see it go back to to something a little smaller like just some really great stuff in there with, between those two yeah and speaking of historic British actors like. Another one of the tricks they use in this film is they use a bunch of old footage right. from one of Terrence Stamp's, uh, is it called Old Cow? Is, am I just using the word old too many times? Nope. Uh, it is, in fact, called Old Cow. They use that as as part of the canon for this film when he talks about you know like his past life with his daughter and his mother's daughter. The daughter footage I don't think is used from that movie, but the footage of stamp with the girl is and it's it's pretty rad like i i oftentimes wish movies would do that and this is one of the only times i've seen movies actually do it i know it's probably considered hokey or uh, there's it's probably an issue too sometimes in fact i read that soderbergh ran into a problem with uh what was it uh wasn't universal it was uh warner brothers or something whoever owns the rights to to old cow like they wouldn't even let him use it poor cow it's called poor Poor cow. cow poor cow gotcha okay that's, Same thing, old poor. I yeah. I mix up old and poor because I'm both of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's it's super fun. Like I love I love how that's used. It's really cool. I I, I agree. I, I love seeing that, and it's one it is one of those things that very rarely is used. Um, it, it, you know, going back to old footage, and and for a variety of reasons, I'm sure it's hard to get. You know, one of my favorite instances, by the way, of use of old footage, totally outside of the scope of this particular movie is 30 rock and there's a sequence where oh, where, right. <laughs> where they show what everybody looks like behind or in front of the camera as opposed to behind and when they show alec baldwin in front of the camera it's a shot from uh hunt for red october right right yeah <laughs> followed by by kenneth being a muppet <laughs> which is the best uh but back to the limey um well maybe also uh there were some some really great supporting uh, stuff in here, supporting actors. Luis Guzman, I thought, I think he's great. It, it's not a huge part, but no, but this might be his best movie. Yo, yeah, I, I, I would probably put it up there. He's, it's, it's a good role. He's, he plays the role of Jenny's one of Jenny's friends that that Wilson doesn't immediately trust, and, and then he kind of interrogates them in the way he knows how, and realizes, okay, you guys are fine, and then. He becomes and, friends too. Yeah, they they were friends, and then he and Guzman yeah. kind of become partners and buddies, and and uh, and and they have some real good dialogue, some real good yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Um, In fact, it's cool because especially at first, I think uh, Terrence Stamp's performance for the first fifteen minutes maybe is super robotic. 
Like there's no emotion behind it. And it, it's not representative of the entire film. Like it's, it's interesting the way it begins, but I think what it does is actually uh, emphasizes Luis Guzman's performance, which I love him and all the stuff he's been in. Uh, oh. But he's he's kind of just a character. He's he's a comedic character in. I can't think of one other thing where he's not. I guess is what I'm saying. It's too often that yeah that he is yeah. he's a straight up, which is uh, fine. He's good at what he does, but he gets to stretch his wings here in a way that I've never seen him do, and it's super fun. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, same same thing with uh, Leslie and Warren. Leslie and Warren. I mean, she she's gotten to do more dramatic stuff, but she's got some good stuff in here. Not a, again, not a ton. Uh, less than Luis Guzman, I think. So Leslie Ann Warren is the. She was daughter's Elaine. acting teacher, I believe. Is that yeah, right? Elaine. She's Elaine. She, she's not in it a ton. She's not, and I'm actually going to disagree with you. Like, oh really? I, I yeah, her performance did not land for me. Fair enough. Just some of the some of the, and I guess most of it is maybe that first or semi first discussion they have in her apartment. Yeah, where she has kind of a lot of hackneyed lines, like like a, it, it's it, not that they're trying to reinvent the wheel here as far as that goes like it's kind of a tried and true story yeah um but some of the lines they give her are almost comedic in how uh, um, i should have written them down but yeah it's I don't fair. Know. I, she it didn't, didn't bother me i thought she fit it, it worked for me um everything after that i thought was cool and i and i bought their kind of budding romance and their relationship type thing like i was into that yeah 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 but yeah I thought it worked. I think it works. Let's okay. Let, let's get let's get to the main the main story here. Though let's get to the main okay. guy. Let's talk about Terrence Stamp. <laughs> let's talk about Zod here. I I I, I fully I, I'm very curious. How did you what did you think of him? You know, so you, you know he was robotic at the beginning. I I actually still think that for me it works. It, you know it, he doesn't he doesn't he he to me he's got he stays robotic up until. He kind of is at a comfort level being where he is and knowing what he's going to do. Like he's on his path and then he kind of, okay, now I'm ready to go. He kind of comes into his character where he, the, he first meets up with like his first, like go see this guy to find out where your daughter went. And it's right. there in like a warehouse somewhere. What's the actor's name that he first talks to that looks like he's wearing prosthetics. Every movie I see him in, I'm like, oh, like he looks like he's wearing prosthetics. That can't be a good thing uh, to say about a man, but i have i'm not sure i think it's william lucking but anyways the when terrence stamp first meets up with him and his group in the warehouse i feel like that's where kind of most of the robotics end and i i think the to be clear i think the robotics like i don't i don't think that's like i'm not bagging on his performance at all like sure i think that adds to his character and especially the kind of inevitability of his character because he's just a steamroller for the most part you know running through all these guys in, in a lot of the sequences which are fantastic but but yeah he's yeah no terrence stamp is great and i, and I <laughs> no he, he is he's great he has he has uh you know I, I i love i love terrence stamp terrence stamp's got a great career um he he's been he's been star wars he was in superman the the guy has the guy has done everything under the sun you know he's done horror movies he's done all of it and I love a good British crime flick and, and I love seeing guys like, like Michael Caine. Did you see he was the first choice for this role? Of course he was. Yeah. Of course he it, was. It almost seems too obvious. Like I, this is definitely a case of I'm glad it wasn't. But. So, so uh, an interesting um, uh, companion piece to this is get Carter. There was a remake of it that was You're really trying. not yeah, great. Or, and it had no. Stallone in it. Oh, the original <laughs> get Carter. Uh, it has Michael Caine in it and it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, hmm. good flick. Okay. So yeah, he, he, he finds the guys in the warehouse and that's kind of his first sends him off in another direction to find his daughter. And it's basically, it's, it's not a ton of procedural stuff. Like I think from then the next place he goes to is the party and they just kind of walk into it Yeah, uh, where uh, Terry Valentine is actually, and that's where he kind of almost shoots him, but ends up killing one of his guys and then takes off. And then I do, I do love some, the, the, I love the, the, the random balcony fight. Yeah. The, uh, random, the, the, the like he walks up and then throws him the, off the balcony. The security guy like, yeah. Hey, wait, bink, you're off. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's that. So it is that, that, that one sequence though, um, with William Lucking at, in the in the warehouse, that that I I just man I love love shots like that I love sequences like that. Well, yeah, that sequence is great because he 
like he gets into the fight with the, or no he doesn't get into the fight he like gets they beat up kick his butt they beat yeah, the crap he gets out of completely him completely taken down and then they they dump him outside and and swear him a bunch and then go back inside and he just kind of hops back up takes the other gun out of his back pocket and then it's 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 the freaking it's the seven samurai thing where all you see you just it stays on the outside and you hear the gunshots and all the screaming and all that and then he walks out or well one of the guys runs out and no and i love it, it because it is it's like it, it's very similar in 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 some respects to the moment in tombstone where you know, right. Kurt, Kurt Russell has his line that you, you tell him I'm coming and hell's coming with me. You know, it's, it's similar in line, similar in delivery, but Terrence stamp with his face, like speckled in blood screaming, tell him I'm coming. Like you it's, are, it's the moment. Yeah. You are so there and you're like, Oh, I want to just see him beat the crap <laughs> out of this guy. I, I cannot wait to see how this turns out. That's and, good. uh, and I think Stamp delivers through the end, like all the way through the end of that movie. He is, you 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 easily can root for the guy and you do want to see, I for me anyways, I did. I wanted to see him like, I wanted to see him take a hammer or a you know something to just oh, beat the crap out of him. And, and, you know, and then the story progresses and, uh, and, and we do get, we get to see the character that, that you're rooting for to kill everybody, to, to actually finish things off remember his daughter and and there's yeah. there's a moment of of okay i understand and things didn't quite go as i expected those scenes are kind of peppered throughout as he's kind of not developing it as you get to understand more about his character like sure he's it's adding depth and that's why i say the robotic stuff definitely doesn't carry through out like he he from that point on turns in some great performances and not just as you know the i'm coming for you guy like it's no, he's, he's, it's really cool he th- there are you know for, for as 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 much of a crime movie this this as this is uh as as much of a revenge story to a point yeah. as this is um yeah, you know there are there are plenty of moments throughout where where you can see Terrence Stamp really like really pulling out that that he's not just he's not just a single minded monster that's going to get revenge. He he also is a father that that lost his daughter, and and there are some great moments where that kind of comes through. Yeah, the greatest moments. In fact, there you could say the end of the movie kind of hinges on that. One hundred. Oh, it does. One hundred percent. Do do we want to? Yeah, let, let's hit that okay. spoiler spoiler button. Here we go. Intern Brandon, <laughs> let everybody know. Uh, we got a new intern. His name is Brandon. <laughs> it's from from the other show. Check out. He's on this uh, show now. He's, he's, uh, oh, he's the, universal. Oh, he helps us out everywhere. It's great. Uh, it, so they they introduce a couple wild cards. There's two hitmen that are that are pretty fun actually. Nick, like one I of lo- them's just I love a him. hammer literally. <laughs> I love Nikki Cat. Nikki Cat yeah. is is that dude is always solid and everything. One of them's in. kind of brainy, Nikki Cat, yeah. uh, and misogynistic and and racist, etc. Uh, so they're bad guys, uh, and they are thrown in the mix and taken out by the feds, I guess. Yes. <laughs> who basically give carte blanche to. Terrence Stamp to do the rest of the movie, uh, even though the hitman show up later. When so so we're in the uh, Terry Valentine escapes with his girl toy, uh, who that girl turns in a cool performance, like very defined role. Like mm-hmm. she's she's just there to make him look even worse, I think. Uh, but does a good job at it. Yeah, and so they they abscond to the where is that somewhere in Big not Sur. Malibu? Big Sur. Thank you. That's right. I keep forgetting. I've been to everywhere in this movie. It's and they set up shop, and his his guy is is there with a bunch of other guys to kind of defend. But the hitmen show up and kind of throw a monkey wrench into stuff to the point where Terrence Stamp has to tie one guy up, and then everybody else kills each other, which is fine. <laughs> and it's like kind of it is kind of funny how that goes down. Like there, there's a little bit of humor <laughs> in the like the fact it's that good. that uh-huh. the hitmen are fighting the guys who originally hired them, and yeah. they're just super pissed that they kind of got double crossed so that yeah. they're going to double cross them. And it's a tense scene too, because and I, I'm guessing this was on purpose, but you do see Terrence stamp kind of start it all and tie that guy up and then you don't see him. So it's kind of like a, you know, where is he? What is he doing? But right. he, he's, he's just kind of sitting back while everybody else is dumb. And then Terrence stamp finally comes in. He gets 
uh, Terry Valentine and the guy breaks his leg trying to get away because he's a total weasel idiot. And he's as he's firing at Terrence Stamp as he goes, Terrence Stamp doesn't even flinch because he knows the guy is going to fire wide every single time. And he does. And it's great. It's real funny. Um, yep. But he finally gets him, gets his hands on him and is to the point where he's going to kill him or not. And basically listens to the guy tell the story and Peter Fonda nails it. Like, you know, he's, he's a super great weasel where he's like, I didn't mean to like, like she was going to call the cops on me. And then it flashes back to where the girl would often threaten to call the cops on her father as he was doing his, you know, untoward stuff. Right. Uh, so in that moment that he sees his daughter saying, she's going to call the cops. He hears the story from this guy being like, she was going to call the cops. And you got to know that he's thinking, no, she wasn't, you know, this is just what she does for somebody she loves, I guess, basically. Right. And in right. that moment, I, I'm guessing kind of sees himself in that guy, you know, because a lot of the movie is Terrence Stamp struggling with his life and the mistakes he's made and, and, you know, yeah, I mean, or he I, could have been a better father. Essentially even, you know. he was an estranged father. He hadn't seen his daughter for yeah. a long time. Yeah. But let's, him live let's terry valentine live at that moment for that reason and then that's where kind of the last puzzle piece falls in and we see that the plane ride where he's sometimes smiling sometimes pensive it takes place at the end of the movie so yeah he, he made it's, it and it's, it's it's great it's pretty great yeah. the the only thing i would have changed and and it's it's because you mentioned how weaselly peter fonda is is if they had recast peter fonda with paulie shore <laughs> that I think would have would have really oh man I uh, so opportunity it, missed there's actually a pretty good interview of Polly Shore with I think Joe Rogan oh yeah dude the guy that guy is way more interesting than I think people realize like he's he is definitely Polly Shore not, yeah he is or definitely Joe okay yeah. <laughs> he is well, both of them but but Polly Shore is definitely not the uh the character that you saw no. all the time. Well, and that's what he talks about. It's part of the reason the interview is interesting. Cause he talks about like, he's like, why did you do it? And he's like, cause I love making movies, man. Like number one, like I was the biggest thing in the world. And how do you react to that? Or how do you like, what do you even do? And number two, I just want to make movies, man. I thought right. it was the funnest thing in the world. Cool. Fascinating guy, man. <laughs> Fascinating history with the uh, comedy store and all that. Yeah. Dude. Uh, but getting back to something that's also equally not hilarious. the weasel at hand. Yeah, the limey. Uh, I, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say uh, I like this movie a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that going into it. I was thinking like 70 stars. Yeah, out of 72. So See? really, really good rating it's on this one. Good. That, yeah. my friends, is the limey. Thank you for checking that out. If you've got other things to say about it, hit us up. Podcast at bookclubformovies.com. Next week's book club for movie selection is gonna be. I don't know what it's gonna be. What's it gonna be? Okay. Say it to me. I'm finding out right now. This week's book club for movie selection is gonna be a classic. We're going back in time here in the early 70s. Oh. We're gonna check out some John Carpenter. We are gonna oh, put an assault on Precinct 13. <laughs> All right. Okay. All I right, am. Right, right. I am super excited for this one. We are, are we gonna do a, an original remake? I show? think I think we should. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and watch both okay. of them this all week. Right. And, I'm watching and, both. All right, Done. let's do it. So the Assault and Precinct 13. Focus on the Carpenter one. If you get the chance, check out the Ethan Hawk one too. Good stuff. We're gonna love it. Podcast bookclubformovies.com. Make sure you check that out. But for right now, let's just do the rest of the show. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know why I said it like that. You're okay, awesome. Mr. Simpson. <laughs> Here are your tacos. I watched a movie. I want to tell you the actors for, and I'm really curious if you know this thing already. I do. I've seen it. I lived it. The commitments. Uh, this movie's got everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. You got that joke way too fast. Uh, Lance Henriksen, Claire Stansfield, John Deal, Gregory Sporlitter. <laughs> That's a good name. Giovanni Ribisi. What the hell? And the incomparable Dan Blom as Thor himself. Thor, of course, standing for trans human mutant original. I forget what it stands for. I, I do not know this. Uh, did you watch? Is it Leviathan? It's not Leviathan. It's Mind Ripper. Mind Ripper. No, it doesn't sound familiar. I like. I watched the riff tracks, so you can imagine the. Oh, all right. 
type of movie this might be but it's one of those perfect riff tracks that's you know riff tracks the guys from mystery science theater and all that it's one of those perfect riffing movies in that it contains again a lot of these actors you've seen in very good movies uh, but also a backstory wherein Wes Craven's name shows up on it because apparently he was trying to backdoor a writing credit for his son in there somewhere. Sure. So uh, it's the the Craven I missed, Jonathan Craven, one of the head writers apparently. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it it really does have everything. It has uh, the monsters, the the mutant guy. Uh, unfathomable direction decisions like Mind ripper I feel like <laughs> it's so ridiculous I dude I do feel like I I have I, I remember this movie and I don't but I never watched it <laughs> it's not worth talking about but it's all it, right it's a great riff tracks number one but number two it's it's they all it's an underground facility where they're performing experiments on humans and one of them mm-hmm. it, it works on and they bring him back for the dead but he begins to mutate and his hair falls out like there's kind of decent practical effects or at least uh period appropriate practical effects to the point where you could kind of appreciate or you know have some love there you oh, know sure, sure uh but <laughs> otherwise it's hilarious like he, he the monster like a, a thing comes out of his mouth that's like a stabber thing and he stabs a guy in the eye with it and he, he goes up one of the other guys' nose mm-hmm. and very then, good yeah he, yeah it's <laughs> and then in <laughs> In an effort to catch him, Lance Hendrickson shows up with his son, Giovanni Ribisi. In real and life. <laughs> they, they enter the complex, and to trap the monster, they come up with this plan where they basically Reese's Pieces him using, like they do the E.T. Reese's Pieces thing, yeah. but with brains. Oh. <laughs> to, to lead him into, a, mm-hmm. into like the freezer or something. Oh. Uh. Horror movies are great. <laughs> I love them. They, they they are good. Check that one out. I'll, I'll send it to you, in fact. Oh, yeah, great. Um, the other thing I watched, uh, Spiritual Successor, Black Panther. I watched it again. Black Panther, the spiritual successor to Mindhunter? Yes, or Mind to, Ripper? to Mind, Mind Ripper, Got Matt. It. Yeah, sorry. Um, Jeez. Where am and I? let me tell you, if you want a pretty good show of two guys barely grappling with the incredibly fun and dense themes of that movie check out the show we already did uh but i (laughs) like i we've talked about this before watching a movie two times for me i'm starting to think i just shouldn't talk about any movie before i watch it two times so (laughs) okay there's that no Uh, i love it i love it 10 times better the second time around and anything i said on that first show is like barely scratching the surface like like the, the thoughts I had were just the beginnings of the things that I saw this time. We're like, man, like I remember at some point I mentioned Eric Killmonger or his father being a victim of their environment, which is just the, it's dismissive in its description of what's actually going on there. Sure. Like it's a bad way. Like the, the, the things that it actually gets into, and I'll say it again, like go, go listen to other people talk about this. After we made that show, I listened to a waypoint podcast on it, which is a hit and miss podcast, but their episode on that was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but there's just so much there. The, the Killmonger character, which I'll still stand by what I said about, um, Michael B. Jordan's performance and to put a finer point on it. I just think that there's not, I feel like a lot of times there's not much behind his bravado. Like he just seems like he's, he's kind of spitting stuff like, as a character or as an actor, as an actor, literally like the character. No, the character is freaking rad, like amazing. Like that's part of the stuff this time around. I'm like, holy crap. Like I did not. While I have issues with the performance, mm-hmm. the character itself is is fantastic because there's there's moments between, especially the fight between uh, Bozeman, uh, Black Panther, and him at the end, where yeah, Black Panther yells at him the correct stuff. You know, he's like, "You've become the people you 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 hate." You know, like you you've taken this too far, but or whatever <laughs> he says. <laughs> but there's there's a point in that discussion where you know he looks at him, and it, it all comes to a head kind of at the end where he takes him to the sunset and all that. Where, you know, he, he looks at Killmonger having been brought up in the time where his behavior would be, was necessary, right? Like the, for the whole civil rights movement, like that doesn't happen with, with like that doesn't happen without a Malcolm X, I guess is what I'm saying. And again, sure. I'm still out of my league here. 
But still, you know, they're, they're in that fight between him and Killmonger. You see him looking at Killmonger and being like, listen, like, I get it. Like, I mean, like speaking of Black Panthers, holy crap. Like we, we needed <laughs> nice. you, like you need to exist because we, you know, what they fought for and what they had to fight for and what everybody needs to fight for, like wouldn't have come without a fight, you know? Killmonger at one point was a necessary evil, maybe, I don't know, but the, the, the whole civil disobedient conversation, all that, again, I'm really fast is not the way to do all this. But in that fight, you see that all come to a head and it's kind of just like, listen, I get it. Like you, they're, you know, <laughs> I can't, I can't verbalize it, but it's, it, it came to me in a way during the second viewing that it didn't during the first one. And it's, nice. it's a fantastic movie. It That's awesome. Really good. Yeah. goes a lot deeper than. Even this white guy could figure out after viewing it one time in a movie theater with a bunch of strangers. <laughs> well, Crazy. and if you couldn't figure it out right then, I mean, geez, because <laughs> you're cl- you're you're the demo that should know it from top to bottom. Watch it again. That's what I would say. I want to. I want to see it again. Look forward to it. <laughs> would you watch this week? I Save got me. I got two movies that neither of which are going to go to the depth of that for sure. <laughs> in fact. We are, we are, while this, this first movie does contain member, member of the Marvel universe, mm. certainly the depth here is much shallower. Uh, I watched Back mm. to School this week. Uh, Ooh. This one uh, rolls in an hour, 36 minutes, directed by Alan Matter, written by Dangerfield himself and Harold Ramis, starring <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield, Sally Kellerman, Burt Young, Keith Gordon, William Billy Zabka, and Ned Beatty. I love this movie, man. I will never not love Back to School. I don't know if I've actually seen it. it I know is, what it is. It is I want to see it. everything that you think it is. 100% is that. It, it's Rodney Dangerfield is a, uh, he's a very successful businessman who has a son that's in college and his son is lying to him about what's going on in college and and he's not doing so well. And so Rodney Dangerfield says, well, I never went to college. I'm going to enroll now as a freshman. (laughs) And it kind of revolves around the diving team and, uh, and Robert Downey Jr. As the best friend who is in every respect, one of the funniest parts of the movie, his randomness, Uh, (laughs) he and he and Burt Young, who, who says next to nothing in the movie and just acts as a big tough guy, which is again, hilarious. If you think about Burt Young <laughs> danger field though, man, he is on fire throughout this movie. There are so many good little, like under the breath, hilarious danger field isms. And, and uh, he's so good. It's he's... so good. And there, there is, there is a tremendous back and forth with uh, there's a cameo by Sam Kinison and as one of the professors, <laughs> of course there is. And, and, and this, there's a moment, you know, he does his, his Kinison thing where he starts screaming and, oh, 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 and yeah. all that. And then he does it in Dangerfield's face and Dangerfield like yells back at him. But in that, like that Dangerfield way where he can't yell, he's just talking really loud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also one of these fun movies to go back and uh, and see Keith Gordon in and Keith Gordon, uh, other movies probably best remembered for is Christine. He was oh. the the main guy in that, but he would go on to have this incredible uh, career as a director. He's been directing movies, lots of TV, uh, but great great director. Huh. R- really interesting stuff to see him him in. Uh, you know, fun movie, super dumb like. I was working out at the time what I was like, I turned this on, I was working out and I, I had to stop because I was laughing. Like I, I, I suddenly like lost all muscle mass and and it's like at the very beginning of the movie, he's doing a commercial for his, his, his business and his business is he is a, he, 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 he runs a tall and fat clothing line. Like that's what he does. <laughs> and, and he's like, he's doing this whole, like this whole bit and just going off about different ways of being fat and all this stuff. And at, at the very end of the commercial, he goes, and remember, if you want to look thin, stand next to fat people. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> for whatever reason, it just, cause it's Rodney Dangerfield. And he's standing next to these two, like really, and he's a big dude. So they had to find two bigger dudes than him. And it's just, it's ridiculous. (laughs) 
other movie uh, I watched, more right. current. I stayed contemporary. This really good movie, by the way. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a reco on this one. I say reco. Right. Okay. Uh, Game Night. This came oh, in, I have it downloaded already. This came in at an hour yeah. and 40 minutes, directed by John Francis Daly, Sweets from Bones, and, and the kid from uh, uh, Freaks and Geeks, and Jonathan Goldstein. Goldstein they, they were also the guys that did uh, the Vacation remake. Written oh. by Mark Perez. I saw the, the Horrible Bosses thing up on it everywhere. Who, oh, yeah, and they, I think, he, I think the they directed yeah. Horrible Bosses Two, which I enjoyed maybe also. I'm not sure okay. which one uh, this one stars Jason Bateman your absolute favorite Rachel McAdams Kyle Chandler <laughs> uh, Lamorne Morris Kylie Bunbury Jesse Plemons and Michael C. Hall uh, everything you've seen from the commercials it the previews is, look funny yeah it it, funny. and it is it, it's it's it was consistently funny for me throughout the movie it is absolutely everything you've heard that it is where they have a game night with friends and and it goes awry and somebody gets what? kidnapped and uh. Uh, and and it was supposed to be a thing and and uh it, it, it i see why this movie hit i i totally get it and did and it do well okay yeah it was a, it was a big hit they they've already okay. they greenlit the sequel for it it's, oh, it's all right. that was that big of a hit for them uh it's funny man it, it's i it, it, it's nothing that you haven't really seen. And, and in, in a lot of ways, this is a comedy version of the Michael Douglas movie, the game. There's a little bit more of a, a of a, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, but it, it plays with that theme a little bit. Hmm. Um, and if you've never seen the game with Michael Douglas, right? Yeah. This is David Fincher, one of the best, if not best uh, Fincher movies, out yeah. there like I, I love that movie that's a great movie that was a good movie too G G but game night game night plays along around with that kind of idea that that maybe it's a game maybe it's not and 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 it's the way they play with it is really funny uh but out of all of this stuff bateman is great love rachel mcadams i actually really like her i know you just can't stand her i think i don't she's, dislike her i just her, her performances i can always it's, it's a, it's a like, i i think she's good here and i think she actually has there are a couple moments she has that, that I, I actually had to rewind and, and, and have Beth like really watch her face because she has a couple of great facial expressions. In particular, there is a moment where uh, they're meeting somebody for the first time and the, the woman holds her hand out like this to like kiss my hand and Rachel McAdams face like she just slaps it with the back of her hand and makes this really <laughs> and it was so funny. Like I, I was dying. It was so funny to me. Um, but the one thing I do want to call out for this movie that I think is really, really, really well done, and this is not a movie you might you, you wouldn't necessarily think would have terrific cinematography, <laughs> but there are a multitude of shots that are absolutely terrific, and they do a really, really fun you they have a really fun use of like tilt shifting. So they're 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 tilt shifting the um the neighborhoods so they look like they are like toys almost. And in some huh. cases they are, and there's a zoom in and then it becomes reality, but it, it's so smooth that it looks great. And huh. there is a, uh, funny the enough, unappreciated it, life of a comedy cinematographer. It's true. You can imagine. <laughs> there's also a sequence towards the end that, uh, is very reminiscent of actually the Black Panther sequence in the bar when they're first looking for Claw and they've got all that one single camera okay. swoop and stuff. This one is definitely, uh, you're highlighting some editing here, but the way it's shot and put together, they make it look like one very smooth shot. And and a lot of it definitely was a single shot. You can see that there's quite a bit of of individual tracking with the characters and how they're moving throughout this, like this room and stuff and going in and out. But there's some really clever editing where they're, they, you know, they'll pass over a, a door frame and you, you like, you just know there was a cut there and then, right. they, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. but, but it's, it's so smooth that it was a great sequence. Like, like I did not expect this, cool. this excellent cinematography and great sequence out of this movie. And, and on top of that, it, it does have, you know, it, it it's, it is a fun brotherly familial story that that has uh, that that touches on again things that you've themes you know about themes you've heard and seen. Uh, nothing 
groundbreaking but really really fun presentation dude i didn't even talk about the cinematography for mind ripper <laughs> and that was an episode of book club for movies <laughs> Uh, if you got movies you'd like us to watch, suggestions to to, to make, hit us up bo- podcast at bookclubformovies.com. Yeah, if you want to suggest that we watch Assault on Precinct Thirteen, let us know. Get us, in, we'll we'll uh, take you up on that. We'll watch it. Email us. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Until then, <laughs> have a good book club for, for movies. movies? <laughs>